Hello, everyone. Welcome to a webinar today on how to fortify your Salesforce ecosystem security. My name is Eric Snyder. I'm the VP of Global Channels at App Omni, and I'm excited to be here today with two distinguished guests. Uh, we have Rachel Beard and Brian Sobey, and in a moment, we'll ask each of them to tell us more about themselves. Rachel, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me today. I'm glad to be here. I am a distinguished security architect at Salesforce. I've been working at Salesforce for nine years, but I've been in the ecosystem for 16, uh, working primarily in the security space for the last 10 years. Uh, what I do every day is I chat with our customers about Salesforce's security architecture, make sure that they understand how their data is being stored and managed, but I also help them with their data security, governance, and privacy strategies so that they can take part in that shared responsibility model and make sure that they're preventing data loss and uh, being as compliant as possible with their org setup. Well, those are all amazing topics that we're going to be discussing today. So um, welcome to the uh, webinar. Uh, Brian, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Brian Toby, App Omni CTO and co-founder. Um, <clears throat> prior to App Omni, my, my whole career has been spent on the security practitioner side, uh, a lot of that working in uh, cloud and in SaaS. And so really in co-founding App Omni, a lot of it came from um, the personal experience of, of quite a few of us over here trying to help customers secure their SaaS implementations and get it right. And so we built App Omni as a product to help support them in doing that as the adoption of SaaS grows and starts to become the you know, the primary way that people are consuming business applications. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Why don't we talk a little bit about the growth in SaaS and what that's looked like over the last 20 or so years. Um, I remember distinctly when Salesforce first started and as a seller, it was like, whoa, this is a whole new thing. It's so much easier to use, but it's completely exploded. Brian, do you want to talk a little bit about what the explosion of SaaS uh, has looked like over the last 20 years? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I think it goes back quite a while and when I was at uh, Salesforce and other SaaS applications where there was that early transition. And, and honestly, Salesforce is a pioneer here. They called it. They yeah. called it um, software should be delivered like, like Amazon, I think was the original idea. Uh, and that's totally right because it's not within the core competency of most organizations to operate, maintain, and, and host software applications. They, they want to get to the core focus of their business. And it's only really expanded from there. And what we saw with COVID was that a lot of organizations were not prepared to backhaul the entirety of their workforce back to their corporate network where some of their on-prem applications existed. And so that only further expanded the adoption of SaaS. Um, it makes sense. It's an absolutely logical uh, approach for companies to take, outsource those things that are not within your core competency. And that's where SaaS comes from. And the SaaS vendors that and the product providers do an outstanding job maintaining their products. They are experts in their products. They run them better than anybody else. Uh, it, it allows for more scale. It allows for a, a just a overall better run software application than uh, companies could do themselves with a hodgepodge of internal apps. Absolutely. And, and a lot of these are interconnected in, in many ways. Apps can connect into each other to build an entire ecosystem. And so, Rachel, I don't know if you have a, a, a moment to, to chat about that, but um, I'd be really interested to hear what your thoughts are there. Yeah, I am seeing that there's a tremendous amount of proliferation in this space, whether it's Salesforce customers who have multiple orgs now where they might have trended towards a single org strategy before um, or having multiple systems that they're trying to manage. And it adds a lot of complexity when I see that because it's hard to get a handle on a complete view of the security and governance of those apps, especially when we have so much change in the data privacy space, so many new regulations coming out uh, all across the world. And um, especially when we see so much data being managed and a lot at stake, if there was any kind of a data breach or insider threat, it just becomes a lot more to manage, document, and monitor. Yeah, and, and there's just a ton of information that um, customers are, are keeping in SaaS and making sure that that's safe and secure really is a, a, a tremendous uh, responsibility. Um, you know, you talked a little bit, Rachel, about the shared responsibility model um, when you were talking about what you do on a kind of a daily basis. Uh, do you wanna walk us through what that is? Yeah, this is extremely important. I mean, first of all, 
a decade or more ago, and I already dated myself when I said how long I've been in this space, but we'd have a lot of people asking, you know, is the cloud secure? What is the cloud? And how is my data kept secure in this type of an environment? Now, I think uh, most companies are, are very well aware of what goes into cloud security architecture, and they understand that it's really important to pick a trusted vendor uh, for, for storing their data and understanding how that company is managed and uh, what goes into their audits and threat detection and what is in the physical controls on their premises and things like that. That's all really important. Um, but then you can't just leave it at that, selecting a secure vendor. You have to also think about your responsibility as a data controller in the privacy space or uh, in any way that you're managing data. So this means what can I do to reduce the surface of risk for data exfiltration? And how can I prevent unwanted uh, logins, basically? So how can I have strong authentication? So in that shared responsibility side, I really try to work with companies to help them think about how can they strengthen authentication to make sure that they keep out unwanted outsiders? That might mean a combination of MFA, single sign-on, maybe also putting uh, their solutions that contain sensitive data behind the VPN, things like that. And then above and beyond that um, account credential compromise risk, then we start to think about what can your users do once they have access to the data? What have you given them access to see and what actions can they take? And then in combination, if they can see data and they can perform an action like deleting that data or exporting that data, um, how can we limit the, the surface of risk there? How can reduce that. So this is where we start to think about a combination of access controls, field level security, profiles, roles, and things like that sharing model, but also some of the advanced tools for monitoring and data loss prevention. Got it. Brian, anything to add? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the, the, the boxes here, the, the four boxes that are uh, sort of grayed out and a little purple here, really represents a lot of the benefit that you're getting from SaaS applications. All those things that you don't need to take care of that you otherwise would have taken care of, uh, had to have taken care of yourself. Um, but as Rachel said, it, it doesn't stop there. And these are, uh, especially when you talk about your, your enterprise grade SaaS applications like Salesforce, these are, these are applications so powerful that you can put any conceivable business process on them. You can have um, in brand new interfaces with your customers where they are applying for different programs, applying for uh, going anything from applying uh, for loans to buying products to partnerships and all of those different things. Well, with that necessarily comes a degree of flexibility that you need as an enterprise to make sure that you can facilitate those business processes. Um, however, with that flexibility comes the need for you to pay attention to, okay, well, we have uh, a thousand partners that just joined our excellent new partner portal that allows us to really open up new use cases and move much faster with respect to our channels and partner team. However, how well are we paying attention to who can see and do what? How well are we paying attention to the variety of different security features uh, within, within Salesforce or within other big SaaS platforms? Are we using them correctly? Did we inadvertently misconfigure something? Our, uh, to Rachel's point about authentication, do we, do we know that we, we have proper authentication in place and do we know that we have proper authorization in place once they come in and once they're authenticated into the applications? Uh, have we encrypted those things that need to be encrypted? Are we monitoring for who's actually doing what and is anybody doing something that is suspicious? Uh, there really are quite a few different responsibilities that come within those top three blocks and customers need to pay attention to them because it's important and you can absolutely undermine uh, what would otherwise be a highly secure application with inadvertent or uh, potentially misguided configuration. Yep, that's a great point. And it sort of leads us to where we're going next in this discussion, which is uh, why one needs to be proactive in this review of what your SaaS applications are really, what, what, is the, what is the posture and what is the configuration of all of these SaaS applications look like? Um, you know, as Gartner's obviously noted that 99% uh, plus of these cloud breaches are really due to preventable mistakes um, that, that result in really a misconfiguration. And it's something that I think we're seeing um, you know, at the App Omni end. I think you're probably seeing this quite a bit uh, on the Salesforce side as well, Rachel. 
Yes, yes, this continues to, to be a problem. And I think it's everything that Brian just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, plus the fact that even when you have a handle on all those squares and grids and your configuration, it changes, right? Your user does. base changes, the policies change, the technologies that you're using change. So it's really important to keep on top of it and to make sure that you have a consistent strategy for managing configuration changes mm -hmm. as they occur and addressing them. So some of the things that I see slip through the cracks are things like uh, a creep in the number of admin permissions that are being granted. Not necessarily the sysadmin profile, but really powerful permissions like uh, modify and view all or configure application. Um, I see gaps in not monitoring how people use the permissions that they have. So do we have users who have a lot of access to data and are extracting that data? And it's also really important to understand that your insider threat is your biggest concern to manage. So you wanna make sure that you understand what those users do, what's baseline normal to be expected, and when somebody is behaving outside of the range of that baseline so that you can investigate and address that as well. I'm a big proponent of human layer security and getting in front of an action before it occurs. And I do think that most of the breaches that my customers encounter, incidents that they encounter, tend to be around accidental misuse of data or accidental data leakage. It's not always yep. a malicious insider. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you have tools in place that can stop somebody from doing something that they might not realize uh, is against your company policy, or maybe they they do realize, but they're just trying to take a shortcut. Yep, got it. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, we can talk and dive in a little bit deeper. Um, you know, and and Brian, I think this might this might lend itself perfectly to to one of the reasons you founded you know the company that we work for. Um, but um, you know, sort of the complex nature of SaaS and it being so disparate, um, and 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 definitely uh, heterogeneous in terms of every aspect of it. Um, maybe talk a little bit about um, sort of what what SSPM means and, and ultimately uh, kind of what we're doing um, to ensure that our customers are, are staying safe. Sure. So some of the traditional approaches to securing things um, really revolved heavily around putting a wall behind it or putting a wall around it. And mm -hmm. so if you wanted to protect something, have it on your internal network, have a, a firewall there, have VPN access if you're outside of the environment, uh, various technologies with respect to uh, you know, dot one X and, and laptops getting on your network to, to help enforce that, that wall and that what's called an m, &M defense. You have a hard, um, crunchy outer shell behind a, a softer inner, inner core. And that was traditionally how people looked at securing applications. And then SAS came along and SAS is by its nature outside of your perimeter. Right. And so you you can't really put a wall around it. And so we have things like, um, like CASB's come along and CASB is basically a proxy. And what you're saying is that you're gonna proxy your users. Uh, you're gonna force them and choke them through this proxy so they go into these um, different cloud products. But the, the nature of SaaS is, is such that that doesn't work. And that, that especially doesn't work for your, your high risk use cases. And it's because if you're gonna have your support portal, where you interact with your customers, you help satisfy those customers poor use cases. The example I mentioned before about your partners, about new customers potentially applying for things, they're not going to go through those perimeters. And if right. you have data leaks and data leaks were exposed to uh, the internet at large or somebody that just signs up for an account so they can apply for your products or your, your company services, your security products that are that are really only choking down your internal users don't cover them at all. And so the only real way to secure SaaS is to look at the applications themselves. Don't try to put a wall around it. Don't try to put proxies in front of it or, or anything like that because it's it's really never going to be effective. I mean, that model works to, to protect your internal users or to look at what your internal users are doing, but to address systems that have both internal and external users, you know you need to go to the source and the source are the applications themselves. And so uh, that is what SSPM does, is it looks directly at the system of truth and it analyzes how it's configured. Is it configured to expose data to people that shouldn't have it? If so, then that in itself is a problem. 
and don't try to put a proxy in front of it to block them from accessing data that is otherwise exposed to them. Like that, that's a game of whack-a-mole that will go on forever. Instead, <laughs> your better approach is to reconfigure those systems to simply not do those things. Um, I mentioned earlier that these are very, very secure and very well-run products. They will behave as you configure them to behave. Um, but that's that's one of the huge benefits of them. But you, if you accidentally configure them to do something that you really don't want it to do, you have to understand that you have just told it to do something that you don't want it to do. And so the much, much better approach is to analyze how you've configured it and compare that against what you want it to be doing. And if those are both uh, the same thing, then great. Everything's going to be secure. You really don't have to worry about product level vulnerabilities in SaaS. Uh, right. because they are so well run. And it's really about looking at how you as the end user, as the customer have configured them to make sure that's what you want. And then monitoring the activities happening within those systems to see that people aren't abusing the trust that that you've given them. Yep. Rachel, anything to add? No, that was a great answer. And it addressed awesome. the complexity that our customers see every day. Awesome. That's great. Okay, perfect. Then we can move on to our next uh, topic of discussion, which is really the state of SaaS configurations. Um, and there are a lot of numbers on this slide, uh, which I'm sure uh, everyone in our audience can read. Um, but but overall, what we're really talking about here is um, just the, the, the mass volume uh, of information that can be uh, made available to the public internet. Um, and these are some of the things that we've seen uh, within some of our our customers. Uh, Brian, do you have any 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 points on this? Yeah, so I I think these represent um, what you'd expect to have happen, given highly highly robust products that are managed fairly manually. I mean, that's just kind of the state of where we are with respect to to SaaS as a whole. Uh, nobody asks a Windows administrator to go manage a thousand Windows servers by manually pointing and clicking their way through interfaces. Uh, it would be ridiculous if you asked that and expected them to get it correct all the time. Um, but where we are with, with SaaS is that uh, these are incredibly robust systems and the, the industry is only now catching up with additional tooling that allows you to really fully understand and automatically test, automatically deploy uh, and do all of those things that we have in other areas of technology. Uh, for example, we're a product company. We would never do a product release without our entire army of test harnesses, bots, linters, other things that analyze what's happening within our product and allow us to be confident about the configuration, in our case, the, the code that we have put in place in our product. Well, all those same challenges exist in SaaS, but as a different layer, it, you need to be, as a customer, you need to be responsible and aware of the nature of your configurations. So what capabilities do you have to analyze those configurations and let you know that you do not have misconfigurations resulting in data access? You do not have um, integration accounts that have been accumulating access over the past two years or your third-party applications that your end users have connected via OAuth or your uh, external data record sharing to the outside world. Uh, we're just in a state where only now are we getting the tooling within SaaS that allows customers to automatically evaluate uh, the result of the configuration that they put in place. Uh, and we know from other areas of technology that if we don't have that tooling and we're dealing with large robust systems, uh, we should expect at some point accidents to occur. And that's kind of what we see. We see a lot of, and it's usually inadvertent. It's usually, you know, whoops, we didn't realize that we had done that or whoops, we didn't understand that those combination of features results in this behavior. Sometimes it's security through obscurity. We have seen people open things up and then try to like hide buttons and links um, but for the most part, it's just the result of uh, dealing with large scale systems without the appropriate level of tooling to backstop them. Cool. Got it. Thanks. Um, that brings us to the visibility that I think we all are are looking to uh, to have within within our applications and within our environments. Um, event monitoring. Um, who wants to who wants to take us off here? Yeah, this is this is my domain right now. Yep, so I'll, I'll, I'll hit the road with this one. So yeah, speaking to everything that Brian just said, there's a lot of sensitive data being stored. And oftentimes when I meet with customers, they don't have a strong data classification process. So they may not even realize 
what data is being stored in which system and who is intended to have access to it where. And then sometimes there's turnover, which also leads to more confusion um, when someone new takes the reins and doesn't have proper documentation and um, they're just inheriting something that's already a little bit uh, confusing, complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, so they really have to find a way to untangle it. Um, Salesforce has rolled out some tools that can help with inspecting data to understand data classification better. And we have many different so, uh, sorts of solutions in our trusted services portfolio that can help. But I want to highlight event monitoring because I think that this is the most valuable to all customers, regardless of what kind of data you process. It doesn't have to be healthcare or financial data, regulated data. Um, if you have any kind of sensitive data, PII, or even competitive data, it's really important for you to understand who is using that information. What do they look at and what do they do with that data? Is that data leaving Salesforce? Uh, what do your admins do? Do they impersonate other users? What do they do when they impersonate those users? Are they assigning new permissions? Are people downloading files that might have intellectual property? It's really important to understand that, but it's also really important to be proactive and not just reading these events as they occurred in the past, but putting policies in place. So event monitoring is designed to help you get that really good picture of, of all the different activities that your users engage in within Salesforce. It gives you the security insights that can help you understand threats as they occur, as well as prevention, but it also gives you adoption and performance insights as you go along. So for example, if somebody ran a report, uh, it's a security event to understand what data was on that report and was that data downloaded and from where and which user, what time of day. But from an adoption performance insight, you're starting to gather which reports are being used so you understand app usage, Mm -hmm. as well as how long did that report take to run so you can understand bottlenecks. Super Same cool. Have, yeah, that's su super cool. That's the type of uh, visibility that um, that enterprises need in order to be secure, for sure. Yep, they absolutely do. And uh, they also need this data to interact with other systems usage so that they can get a very robust picture of what an individual user does. So going back to where we started and the proliferation of SaaS apps, if you're trying to understand maybe a bad actor and mm -hmm. their imprint and in your company, you need to really be able to integrate all that data to get that big picture. So uh, moving on, the, the things that event monitoring can bring to the table are really detailed event log files that are ready in daily batches. And these are typically the types of logs that I see companies wanting to extract and uh, work with in their tooling to analyze and, and get that big picture view and, and find that baseline and, and where are the outliers. But we also have real-time event monitoring as well, which allows you to stream events as they occur so that you can inspect these events in real time. And these real-time events are also what's powering points three and four here on the slide. So threat detection and transaction security. These two things are gonna sound kind of similar, so I'll try and differentiate them to you. They're both, uh, they're both working with real-time events. Threat detection is going to uh, use our machine learning and it, our algorithm will process each transaction and kind of rate it as to how does this event uh, look, for lack of a better word, in mm -hmm. terms of in contrast to the other user events. And this is really pertinent for reporting and API anomalies. So if I'm running a report, fine, but am I running a report on data that I don't usually interact with or from a new location or from an unusual time of day? Mm -hmm. Threat detection can help detect that anomaly and highlight that for you. Transaction security is different because transaction security is more preventative and you, the customer, set the conditions. So rather than our algorithm deciding, you get to decide. You're going to set a threshold and say, you know what, it's okay if our users download data, but alert me if they're downloading more than a thousand records at a time. Or it's okay if users are looking at sensitive data, but I don't want that sensitive data going into reports. So let's block it so that they can't process it in bulk or don't let them download it in bulk. So 
Uh, those are the types of policies that I tend to see the most of for transaction security are more data loss prevention oriented. But again, mm -hmm. you set the policy versus threat detection where machine learning is kind of just running in the background detecting. And then all of this can be used in our analytic studio app. We uh, provide 16 pre-built dashboards that help highlight, highlight security adoption and performance activities. So again, understand the baseline normal activity for your org. You can filter down by role, by profile, by day, whatever it is you need to do. Um, but to get that really quick insight just for Salesforce. And again, this is where I tend to see that uh, customers need more help in terms of analyzing and consolidating that data. Yeah. So next, next slide is kind of like just an eye chart of, of events. Um, and these are all the things that you might put into um, your analytics tool that would help you understand the user activity. I'm not going to read all these to you, but from a security perspective, <laughs> yeah, I know it could take a while. Um, might the be here. Might, yeah, we'll be here for a minute. You might be most interested in reporting, especially exports, as well as uh, page views, especially if you have people of interest like celebrities or politician data, mm -hmm. file transfer, API access. Those are all going to be really important for understanding user um, access to data, but that login as and permission sets events are also really important for understanding admin activity. And then you have all this great stuff that's uh, around Apex performance and Lightning performance that can also really help you monitor the health of your org. Brian, I think this might be an area where uh, you might be able to describe sort of a little bit about how uh, Salesforce and some of the solutions and 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 features that Rachel was talking about a minute ago, uh, you know, sort of interact with uh, with with App Omni and an SSPM solution. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's no question that Salesforce event monitoring is is absolutely a top tier uh, ability for giving customers access to exactly what is happening within their SaaS environments. Um, you get a very, very comprehensive level of visibility into activities across the product, whether those are your internal users, external users, the different ways in which people are operating. Um, but then part of the challenge for some of our customers is that their uh, security operations teams, those teams that are classically responsible for uh, security related monitoring of systems, don't necessarily have a deep level of expertise in how their organization is using Salesforce. And that leads to challenges that it's tough for them to distinguish good versus bad because maybe they don't understand the the business cases behind it or um, the the just just based on uh, classical behaviors of a given type of product. Uh, what does good look like? What does bad look like? And they don't necessarily have the time to go to training for the different products for which they're responsible because they're responsible for everything their company uses. And that's really where an SSPM picks up is that the SSPM product is responsible for providing that expertise and that depth into the different SaaS applications to let them know, oh, the, in Salesforce, this is actually a suspicious pattern of behavior. Because if you see this, then you see that because of the nature of, of, of this product, maybe that suggests that it's something that you want to look deeper in. And so what we do is we pull in what SPMs do as a class uh, should be pulling those events from those uh from those products from Salesforce and Salesforce mm -hmm. event monitoring, and then uh, take that into one consistent feed. Typically that's going to mean you normalize the different formats that are coming in and different types of events are naturally gonna have different formats. So if you have a large number of different streams, you're gonna have different formats and you need to, you need to first get them to a place where you can, you can work on them and you can make use of them. Um, so normalizing that into a stream and then running application specific detections based on it. Uh, Rachel mentioned looking at here, here's your baseline, uh, here's good, here's bad. Uh, it really needs to look for those things. And to have that deep level of application expertise is really the key thing because you can't apply generic detection to um, large robust products and expect it to be effective. Maybe you'll look at logins that are coming from a place that you know to be bad, uh, but those are fairly superficial with respect to what good looks like in terms of a good monitoring and operational uh, SecOps capability for those different products. Um, and so that's really SPM's role is to come in and take those event streams, to run detections over them, to call out those anomalies, uh, you know, standing in for its its position in the ecosystem as the, the platform of expertise in a variety of SaaS, 
and then deliver to your existing tools, your Splunk, your Sumo, your Elastic, whatever your, your SIM is or your uh, detection stack is, deliver to those tools, those alerts, and uh, typically the, the origin uh, and original event streams as well. Uh, so SSPM is not intended to be a replacement to your existing security operation stack. In fact, I don't really know a lot of teams that want to use Splunk for uh, all things non-SaaS, but just for SaaS to go into this totally different product and to do right. hunting or to do detection there. Uh, really, SSPM should be a feed into those products and into your existing tool chain that you probably have you know, quite a bit of money invested in tools and team and everybody there. Uh, it's supposed to be really a, a partner to those systems and a the best data source possible into those so they can get the maximum advantage of event monitoring or other um, SaaS event feeds. Got it. Great. Rachel, do you have anything to add here? Just that this is so valuable, and I and I hear this concern all the time from the companies I work with, is that they they need a way to manage this process. So I love yeah. seeing this. This is awesome. Uh, this is great, and I think everybody here has learned uh, quite a bit today. Um, so with with that in mind, why don't we move to a couple of questions? I see that we have two currently. Um, so I will I will read the question, and then um, if one of you would like to take that uh, and start with it, uh, they're definitely aimed at you two. Uh, the first one was, can you describe a time an internal threat uh, was not a bad actor? Oh, yeah. I actually just heard about one of these recently, and it was something that looked, looked like a bad actor, but it, it actually wasn't. It was somebody who wanted to do something they had mm -hmm. an idea and they uh, weren't at their desk and they had their spouse's laptop right next to them they grabbed it they weren't required to use a company device they started you know running reports and looking at data they downloaded a report because they wanted to bring it into excel make a pivot table do whatever they were doing and mm -hmm. now this data was living competitive data on an ungoverned laptop with no company protection on it. So um, you don't know if that gets synced to some other backup, uh, disk backup, or it could end up in an email or on a thumb drive or something like that where you can't mm -hmm. control it anymore. And that person genuinely did not think that they were doing something wrong. Um, this is not a Salesforce story. This is a story I heard from a from a customer, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, that's the kind of thing that, that where, where I talk about human layer security, that's totally preventable. That's absolutely mm -hmm. preventable. Um, and why let that happen? So sure. I really like to think about proactive strategies. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think we talked a lot about proactive strategies today. Uh, what can we do to get a better purview into the, the configuration, into the into the um, posture of, of Salesforce and other uh, SaaS applications? Uh, the second question that popped up, and thank you for answering the first one, uh, was, and this one's this one's actually kind of interesting. It's it's, how do I get started if I want to 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 build a, a security program around Salesforce and other applications? I don't know, Brian. I don't know if you would like to maybe kick off that one since Rachel took the last one. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think I think an important part of that question is the the build the security program concept. Yeah, um, you are not going to be successful in managing SaaS security as as a one off or as a temporary project. This is the future of the way that your business is probably going to be using business software. It needs a security program. It needs a deliberate, intentional effort to make sure that you are using and your company is using SaaS in a secure way. Um, I mean, the, the the reality is that a lot of your risk is going to be concentrated into um, not a huge number of SaaS applications. While your company may use 100 or more, uh, you have your big flagship applications in your industry-specific applications that are going to have the keys to the kingdom. Those are going to be the places where your critical data resides. Those are going to be where your critical business processes are. Those are going to be the places that have all the key integrations that you need to focus on. Um, so a lot of companies, what, what we recommend is really taking a look at what are your biggest risks with respect to SaaS applications and finding a way to get a handle on that first. You can't boil the ocean. You can't go secure all of them at the same time, 
but understand that you do have crown jewels and you do have um, have these. Typically, it's your larger application. Salesforce is almost always um, one of your your most important SaaS applications, if not your most important SaaS application. And start at those places and start at uh, understanding what is going to give you that continuous monitoring, what's going to be able to evaluate how you are today, you know, stop the bleeding, make sure it doesn't get any worse, and then work to probably dig yourselves out of the hole that you've been digging for the last 10 years before you had any meaningful visibility. Um, get event monitoring, get threat detection, start looking at who's actually doing what and start to build those patterns of what looks good and what's bad, and then integrate with those teams. I mean, done properly, a, a SaaS management program, a SaaS security program is going to reduce the friction between the teams. You don't have to have fire drills in production when you find out that something's bad. If some new you know, article of the month comes out about something that you need to look at in a particular application, uh, it doesn't have to be a big investigation to figure it out if you had a handle on it the whole time. So um, done properly, you're going to be able to move um, just as fast, if not faster, by making sure that you integrate well with the release process, that you know at all times the overall posture of things, so you don't have to field fire drills, and you know who's doing what within these systems, so you can be, you can have comfort in the fact that uh, these are well managed and well monitored platforms. Yeah, feels like a, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, uh, in 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 this case. Um, it absolutely. If anybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that some of the the things that I like to focus on. Um, would be really understanding data classification. So what is the data that you're storing and what is the sensitivity level and what are the compliance uh, obligations around that data? That strong authentication, really good access control so that you have a least privilege access model in place and then monitoring. And then once you understand what's baseline, then you know what you want to add prevention to. So I kind of look from it from that multi-phase approach, but um, it really is important to understand the data and the users to get going. Awesome, thank you. Um, I, I think if anybody else has any questions, they're more than welcome to put them into the, to the chat. Um, but in the meantime, what I'll do is talk about where to find us. We clearly have a, a nice partnership between us and uh, obviously want to help uh, any customers or answer any questions that anyone may have. So if anybody has any questions for um, the App Omni team, uh, our information, as you can see, is, is on the screen. And from a Salesforce perspective, we also have a, a wonderful contact that we work with daily um, who anyone can also reach out to for any questions. Um, with that, I think we are wrapping up. Um, does anybody else have anything else they'd like to say or share? Uh, we learned a ton today. Um, I can definitely say that much. But uh, if, if anybody else has anything they'd like to add before we, we sign off, um, I'll say thanks, thanks to both coming. of you. Yeah, it was great being here. I appreciate everyone. Thank you. It was great. Thanks so much.